Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Share Your Green Design podcast. Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder that you can follow and subscribe to us over on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also find the full video version of each episode over on YouTube. We're also on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and WeChat at Share Your Green Design. That's all one word, Share Your Green Design. And remember, the podcast is only one small part of what is an ever-growing platform. So head on over to shareyourgreendesign.com to keep up to date with the latest in sustainable architecture, engineering, and construction. We've got projects, news, research, events, competitions, student work, jobs, everything you need. We'd love to have you as a visitor, but also as a contributor. So you're always welcome to send us your own projects, ideas, events, job openings, and much more. You'll find all the details on shareyourgreendesign.com. Once again, that's shareyourgreendesign.com. Thank you again for your support. And with that, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. So this is an interesting episode because it's not the first time that we've had two guests on the podcast because episode two we had two people but it is the first time that we've had two people from two different kind of locations which is uh which is interesting so we'll see how it uh we'll see how that goes uh so first we have vulcan uh vulcan dota do you want to introduce yourself vulcan sure yeah this is vulcan dota uh i'm an associate director at atelier 10 uh working in our environmental design team in london Awesome. And with Vulcan, then we have Andrea, who you're kind of the common connection here because you're my colleague and you're also Vulcan's colleague. So do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yes, I have the pleasure to work with both. I'm a senior mechanical engineer and project lead at Atelier 10. And I'm a business technical advisor with Charger Green Design, looking forward to enhance the communications. Awesome. So obviously the, the, the way this podcast kind of kind of came about is because Andrea works in our team she also works at Atelier 10 so we were kind of interested in uh, not only kind of hearing what other people on our team do and what they're involved in but also just trying to get an understanding of uh, their the, the the kind of other engagements that they do and other people who who they who they work with every day and what the what the common common connections are between different people in the field so do I, should we maybe start off by telling people who Atelier 10 are for people who haven't heard of them, so does someone want to give an introduction into in, into into them and what 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 kind of work they do and who they work with? Sure, absolutely. Um, so we are a sort of international building services and environmental design consultancy. Originally, sort of coming out of London, really, but right now uh, we have a pretty strong presence in North America as well as Australasia, so Singapore, Australia, Bangkok, that that territory. Um, in general, sort of what we are known for typically, what we bring to a lot of the projects that we work on is um, sort of integrated thinking around sustainability with the building services as a focus subject, uh, facades and building services, I would say. Um, we do have a core sort of MEP, sort of mechanical, electrical, public health services uh, delivered out of our London office, but actually outside of London, primarily driven by environmental design, which is what I do in our London team too. Uh, we offer a range of services really uh, beyond sort of typical uh, design consultancy, but looking into sort of whole life carbon, energy assessment, uh, daylight benchmarking, uh, strategic carbon uh, sort of uh, strategies for major companies and so on. So that, that's sort of the field we operate in. And of course, much more specifically in the construction side, as in like, you know, the building, uh, you know, architecture engineering uh, territory. And we tend to work with uh, fairly interesting projects, really, uh, with some of the uh, you know uh, most popular, uh, you know, best known architects, and uh, some of the more challenging projects are because of that as well. Uh, the projects that are trying to push the limits, uh, not only in terms of uh, you know architectural design, but also sustainability, environmental design, and all the issues related to it. Um, so yeah, I mean uh, that's that's. In very uh, brief terms, uh, what we do, who we are. Uh, I'm sure Andrea, uh, maybe with an engineer background, may have a word or two to add as well. Uh, for experience. Well, thanks. Yeah, the the background you have given is, is excellent. And we, in the side of the engineering, I also want to mention, uh, not only do we coordinate within the London office and other offices in the UK, the MEP side, which is mechanical, electrical, and public health. We also have the service for 
fire protection and a lovely design of lighting services that brings a different aspect to the projects that, that we develop in both commercial, residential and educational buildings. Mm. Yeah, we're going to get into as well how both of you work at Atelier 10 and the, the, the kind of unique things that both of you do, but also maybe some examples of, of, of where you overlap and where you have things involved in. Um, one thing about the two of you, you've both been at Atelier 10 for, for a number of years, right? You've, you, you both have a long history there. I'm curious about where, how your journey through your career led you there and maybe how your interests in sustainability kind of evolved over the years that led you both to, 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 to find yourselves at Atelier 10. So maybe Andrea first, how, how, how did your career kind of unpack from education all the way through and what role has sustainability his, historically played in that? Was, was it always something you were interested in or was, uh, was, was there a kind of moment in your career where you, this passion for sustainability was, was invoked in you? Where, so how, what, what, what's your trajectory like? Thanks, Naya. I'm a person from Venezuela. I studied in Venezuela, in South America. And during my high school, I studied for the Petroleum Olympics. So there are many reasons why you choose a career and I must say that that was as well one of them. When I learned about the refinery of petroleum and I was interested on the processes and how this develops, I, I definitely uh, gained a passion for engineering. So once I was in university studying mechanical engineering, I learned about how machines can affect the environment and how efficiency of machines must be a priority in the designs that we do. That's what led me to focus my efforts on sustainability as well as renewable energy. I came mm -hmm. to the UK for a year uh, where I focus on, on that sustainability design. And also I have worked in hotels where the installation of projects related to sustainability, to solar panels, solar collectors, gave me the desire to learn more about a design in collaboration with others. And that's how I arrived to Atelier 10. It just met the right fit for me. And I have been here almost seven years now. Yes. Wow. So the stars kind of aligned. I'm actually curious, what do you, did you say the Petroleum Olympics? Yes. Yes. Or did I pick, so, what, what, are, what are the Petroleum Olympics? Well, this might not be in every country, but Venezuela is a, a large uh, pro, um, oil producer, oil producer yeah, country that focuses on oil. So this is a um, uh, competition that happens during high school where three students from three different years create a team and then they compete in regionals, nationals, and um, yeah, uh, all, all the way to the end. And we had the, the blessing and the opportunity to arrive all the way until the top two of the entire country. So this led us to meet the president of the Ministry for Petroleum at the time. And what you need to learn to do this is to actually understand the process, the chemicals, the, the, the industry. And yeah, make me um, very passionate about how do things work. That's so ironic that your involvement in petroleum and the oil industry led you to sustainability <laughs> rather, than, rather than deeper into the oil yeah. industry. Yes. That's so interesting. Yeah. And Vulcan, you, in some ways, I guess you, you, you have some things in common with Andrea because you, you also have this kind of international background as well. Do you want to unpack that a bit? Sure. Uh, even more so, I would say almost, but um, I'm originally from Turkey uh, and did you yeah. know, most of my education in Turkey actually until university as well, until mid high school, let's say. Um, but I was actually, you know, the, the interest in sustainability and, and environment was pretty much there almost like from day one, as far as I can remember. I was, I was that kid in the shopping mall setting up a table and sort of like collecting signatures for, you know, like uh, planting trees and things like that. And I was like, you know, seven, eight, nine, that, that ring, wow. you know, through the primary school almost uh, process. 
Um, and then, you know, in high school and such, I was actually much more steered towards engineering and sort of more science, science based education, just various reasons for it. Obviously, not getting into details, but, um, but then at some point I had a sort of twist and I said, okay, I need a bit of a change of pace, you know, because if I stay like this, I will become an engineer possibly. That was the sort of the next step essentially. But is there anything else I can fit in? So I actually uh, went to an international high school in Italy for two years. Uh, just on my own, really, leaving everything and family and friends back home. Uh, and where I was uh, sort of introduced to uh, really humanities and sort of uh, social sciences and history and, you know, architecture, more importantly, too, which then uh, set the track for the rest of it, which uh, became this university sort of college education in the States. Uh, with a dual degree in architecture and mechanical engineering. So you know, it wasn't quite a full split, but it actually introduced architecture into that. It you know, gave a bit more purpose to the engineering, essentially, okay, these are the things that I want to do. And um, luckily enough for me, I should say, uh, I went to a university where um, there, was a lot, there were a lot of Atelier 10 projects. In fact, the reason that Atelier 10 had a presence in the States was the university I was studying. So, you know, uh, people including Patrick, Paul, who are, you know, uh, in our leadership team today, were teaching there and sort of infusing this uh, sort of sustainable design ideals into young students like myself. And I could actually see the buildings that they were working on and I could be in them and, you know, ex experience the, the value of these. Um, you know, from that day almost, I want to be in Atelier 10 at least, uh, you know, to see how it is to be behind the scenes of that a little bit more. I did have a bit of a detour. I started actually as an architect for almost two years before joining Atelier 10 in the States. And then eventually the opportunity came about that I could join Atelier 10, uh, you know, at the bottom of the ladder back in the day, uh, started in our New York office uh, with that too, but eventually moved to London about six years ago. So I've been, I've been with Atelier 10 almost 10 years now, nine and a half or so. Uh, and it's been a journey really around the, around the world, around the, you know, different offices and different practices that finally brought me here, um, which is both a value, uh, and also has a big carbon footprint that I'm trying to, you know, uh, suppress and, you know, compensate for right now. <laughs> and do you want to tell it up? What, what, which is a bigger carbon footprint going directly from Venezuela to the UK or going from, Turkey to Italy to the UK to the US. I'm trying to but anyway, we'll figure that out. That's you. You uh, you talked at the last thing you mentioned there was about the value of in, of international travel, which uh, which I definitely agree with, and that was something which I was curious about for both of you. Which is how how does how have you seen attitudes to sustainability differ? in the different areas of the world you've been in. So for Andrea, for example, I would imagine that sustainability is seen different in Venezuela versus the UK because a lot of Venezuela's economy or a certain uh, proportion of it is dependent on, on oil. Uh, whether it's in the UK, that's not necessarily the case. And Vulcan as well, going from Turkey to Italy, so that kind of European uh, context all the way to the States and back to the UK. You must have been exposed to different definitions are different uh, different emphases on sustainability how uh, firstly is that the case or is it more global than that i'm making it out to be and also how how do you think that's kind of influenced you as you've as your own career has developed so may, maybe andrea first do you want to uh, talk okay. about that definitely there is a difference and i will say not only in the country where you are and the region but also on the year where you're working True. Yes, because um, I will say that as we have progressed um, in the past, say, 10, 15 years, it has definitely grown more, and that will be in almost any country. Um, with that said, I, was, I will describe as Minnesota, we had the opportunity to have a large percentage of the energy being produced via hydropower, which is actually mm -hmm. quite helpful to the environment. And... That yeah. is just because we have that much resources in terms of water. So it's not something that you will find everywhere in the world. And that kind of directed the, the production of energy in <clears throat> being already kind of sustainable. Um, and when that fails, then it goes everything being produced out of uh, diesel generators, etc. 
Um, so yes, there was no really an effort put into creating more sustainable solutions in terms of energy. Um, at the same time in the construction industry, not really a focus on sustainability, but there were different reasons. There were other reasons why to do it. Maybe lack of power, maybe lack of, um, a, or different regulations in the, in the country that made you kind of think, okay, what can we do that is different to the standard so we can find solutions and definitely sun is a, is a resource that is everywhere. And that's why we were able to install solar panels, solar collectors, and um, bring value to the, those installations. They were not only giving a backup, but sometimes even given the prior, the primary source of energy. Um, in, from then uh, until now, I see that there's a lot of effort in terms of looking for projects that are sustainable uh, around the world. So that will be different countries in, in Latin America, Brazil, Peru, Chile, um, and even even Africa and, and Asia. But I will say it's kind of concentrated in a, in a team. So maybe there is a, a specific team throughout a, in every country that is really trying and pushing, and it's about connecting and communicating so that other teams can also uh, understand the power of it. Yes. Hmm. Vulcan, what would you say? How about you, Vulcan? Does that I mean that to that chime with your own hmm. your your own experience? That, that resonates to some extent, but there are differences too. I would say. I think I think there is a um, split in the level, like type of focus based on really the arc of development in the country to some extent, if I may say so. Um, so, you know, uh, if you take the Turkey example from earlier life, um, there's a greater awareness of the value of resources in something, right? Because every resource is something you need to use appropriately because you don't have an infinite amount of it, uh, which actually does vary from the sort of the more developed world perspective, which is sort of like, you have access to a lot of things that you kind of take it for granted and therefore you, you, you use it, you know, in a different way than people would be in the other side, let's say. But at the same time, there is also in the, let's say, in the Turkish experience, uh, there's a bit more focus on the local context as opposed to the, the bigger picture, the global issues, you know. Uh, I would always, you know, make fun of this as a, as a child, really, or, you know, as a young adult, let's say, that one of the key aspects of sustainability I remember from Turkey was a sign on the grass that said, don't step on the grass. Uh, and the reason for that was that, you know, you're in an environment where grass doesn't grow as easily, but it's an amenity, it's, it's sort of a public shared good that for, is for people to use and enjoy, right? So if everybody was running on it, you would need more water, more replacement, more of all these things, uh, that then would probably mean that it's not maintained at all and therefore not, you know, be available to people. Whereas like, you know, coming to the UK right now, like telling someone that, you know, you shouldn't step on the grass, it doesn't make sense, you know, like, you know, it just doesn't fit in that way. Um, so, but, but actually it, it was much more about the, you know, experience of people firsthand. It was their relationship to their local environment, the quality of it, and how to sustain that really, uh, with limited resources. So, and of course there are other aspects of it, you know, awareness levels being different potentially. And also, as Andrea was mentioning, sort of maybe the, the bottom, uh, when we talk about sustainability, there's usually two tiers. There's the, the bottom that barely complies with things because they've been told to comply with things, there's a regulation or something like that, versus there is the, the cutting edge, let's say, in whichever local context has tried, that tries to push the agenda forward, that wants to do more and better. Um, and that's, that's everywhere the same. Everybody who is aware of the issues we are, we are you know, faced with is really doing, trying to do their best, and that's globally the same. But the bottom is quite a bit different because there may not be enough awareness and enough sort of support to lift that bottom to the same level. That's where more more developed countries have maybe a bit more of an advantage at time because of the experience of earlier industrialization, maybe because of all sorts of different reasons. But that's where you maybe see a bit more of a difference there. Yeah. Hmm. Fast forwarding then to today and Atelier 10. So it would be cool to hear a little bit about some of the day-to-day -day work that you do in the in the firm because when you look at Atelier 10 and as you've already mentioned uh, you offer a lot of different services there's a lot that you contribute whether it's uh, you know mechanical or data etc one of the projects which would be recognized I think to a lot of people particularly now is the uh, Google complex which uh, just opened in Mountain View California 
Uh, so it was designed by Brock Ingalls Group and Heatherwick Studio. And we're, we're recording this in late May. I think it just opened last week. And one of, and I know and Atelier 10 had involvement in that. Uh, so some people might not know I write for Arconnect, the architecture website. We wrote, wrote up the news story last week about this uh, big complex opening. And we always get comments on our articles. And one comment, it was a positive comment. And it talked about uh, we should give a lot of credit to the what they called technical wizardry behind the scheme uh and they particularly alluded to the the complex nature of the roof and the the what looks like this kind of uh, dragon uh, dragon scale solar tiles uh, tens of thousands of of solar tiles i think which which kind of carpet this roof Uh, but i thought technical wizardry was just a phenomenal way of describing it but um, I know Vulcan in particular, you have some knowledge of that project and you, you tease, you have one or two stories about it, uh, but do you want to maybe maybe use that project as a vehicle for uh, for explaining or giving an insight into what Atelier 10's role can be in these major projects that you're often involved yeah, in? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, the first thing I should probably clarify there, even though I mentioned, you know, we have an international presence and so on, it may look like a, we are a big corporation of sorts that, you know, like have arms reaching everywhere. But actually, globally, we are 300 plus people, so 330 people or so. Uh, we are, we take pride in punching above our weight in, in these kinds of things. Uh, because uh, we, we see value in exposure to a lot of different projects and learning from each experience and adding the next step, you know, pushing the project to where it needs to be as a next step. And we are sold for that reason too. And actually the, the sort of the Bayview, uh, sort of the new Google buildings that just opened, as you mentioned recently, are a brilliant example of this because uh, when we were first involved with this, you know, Google is obviously a, a very big client, has aspirations, has an image that they want to project, and, you know, they want to obviously be in the, on the cutting edge of environmental design as well as, you know, architecture and, you know, all these things. Uh, and actually, when we first started with that project, uh, we, uh, we were given a brief that was a glass dome, like fully glass dome in the oh. middle of uh, California. It took us about a year maybe to convince the entire stakeholding party that uh, that wasn't a good idea. Um, and, uh, you know, we used a lot of headbutting, a lot of analysis, a lot of, you know, arguments around like the internal conditions that had to be maintained and what it would involve in terms of mechanical services to the space, as well as, you know, the expectations that, you know, this glass dome will actually not be used as a glass dome because there will be a lot of, you know, it's a very sunny part of this world where you will have glare and discomfort for visually and thermally and all those things that had to be taken into account. And eventually the scheme that ended up being built was in, in very large parts uh, what it is today uh, based on our contributions to the, the design earlier on at that concept design stage. Um, but because of that same scale issue, we were also not necessarily involved in the later stages of the project. So what we, what we often do is we get in there, set the project on the right track, based on this kind of database analysis, you know, a lot of uh, visualizations, a lot of analysis. I, we, we have a slide, actually, you know, if you're doing a presentation, I'll probably have that as a background. There are hundreds of colorful images that were studied, done in a couple of months' time to support this vision for, you know, the, what this building should look like. Um, and, uh, and that put the project in the right track. That then, of course, became that dragon scale PV because, you know, you actually had the opportunity to do this. You are, you're building a massive tent, right? I think it's it's about like seven megawatts of uh, solar power generation. That is a power plant. Uh, you know, it's 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 it's, it's a very large wow. amount. But I I wouldn't reduce the building to just its um, skin that way either, because there's a lot more going on in that project. Uh, the two I will flag very quickly for those that might be interested is that um, it's pro it's, it is officially I think the largest underground uh, geothermal pump installation, like heat pump installation in the states in North America. I think Canada included. It has something like hundreds of miles of pipe work to uh, sort of interact with the ground in terms of a heating and cooling exchange to, uh, to balance those with a minimum energy efficiency, low maximum energy efficiency, minimum energy use, but also a lot of water protection because uh, normally in these buildings you would have cooling towers that would be using a lot of water. Uh, and that's completely eliminated in that sense. So that's one feature of it that is actually an engineering feat, uh, especially for the delivery team. You know, we can say this is a good idea, but it's actually not easy to implement in a building uh, at that scale. The second one, actually, which is a much more recent obsession, rightly so, is the embodied car- carbon side of the story. The idea there was this. Obviously, it's a big, massive sort of trust work, open space, so there's a lot invested into it. 
But one of the driving uh, sort of visionary elements of it was that Google is here to stay. They will have this building. They're the owners of the building. They will run this building for the foreseeable future, maybe even not not foreseeable future. Everything on the net t- t- tent is modular, flexible, demountable, and it doesn't need to deal with the element. So you can actually configure a lot of it using you know modularity, circular economy, low and value carbon, healthy material as these things progress as well over the next decades. All of that is removed from the building. So you know you, you can actually create, you, you have a playground almost that's sort of separated from the outside. And those are incredible features, right? Like you, know, you don't get a lot of clients going all the way out there to enable something like this and actually deliver it. And a lot of these were, you know, supported through studies. And that's, that's really the kind of studies that I do, which is, you know, looking at not just the daylight, not just the glare, not just the, you know, thermal comfort and how much energy we will be saving, but what is the water story? What is the material story? And bringing all those together is what I do in my role, more or less. Um, and I do it across a lot of different projects simultaneously. So I couldn't really pinpoint one project uh, that I work on right now because I probably support 10 different projects in a similar role. So it's a very different dynamic that way too. Uh, but through that, you learn and you, what you learn, you put to use in the other project too. So it creates this sort of like Robin Hoodish almost, if you want to call it that way, uh, exchange of ideas and pushing the limit at every project, one idea at a time, let's say. Uh, and you know the end results can be as fascinating as the the Google Daisy building process. Mm. I'm going to bring Andrea in here in a second as well to to unpack some of that. But one uh, first, so th- those stories are actually fascinating, and I think somebody and I'm definitely one of these people. When I first looked at the building, I assumed that the that this kind of tent like structure was a, a Bjork Ingels group or a Heatherwick uh, driven idea from day one and it just kind of evolved and uh you know the 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 consultants etc fed into this it's really interesting to hear that that wasn't necessarily the case that this uh what is un- undeniably the architectural draw of this scheme wasn't was a large part was an engineering solution or an engineering led solution and it's a subversion of what many people would would assume and I think what a lot of architects even would assume is the is the hierarchy within design teams where the architect comes up with the concept and the engineering and the planning and heritage, et cetera, feed in to try and evolve this. But th- this is a good example of an alternative way of approaching things, which you could definitely argue has, uh, has led to uh, not only a more sustainable project, a more efficient project, but a more beautiful project in the end. And I'm wondering, and Andrea, maybe you can um, give a perspective on this as well. How representative is was that project of uh, of of the way you typically work in the design team? So, do you, do you, do you often find yourselves trying to adapt your services to what particular architects want, or? Like the Google project, are are you a lot more active in saying, in, in, in a lot more active in the design process and saying, you know what, if we if we if we took a different approach here, the engineering solution would not, not only be more efficient, but you know it would actually lead to a more interesting form. So I, I guess the overall question is, what is the what 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 is the dynamic like between yourselves and say an architecture team like, you know. Big or Heatherwick and Zaha Hadid Architects is another firm you've worked with as well. What's the dynamic like between between the two of you? Very interesting question. And uh, there is a different perspective, uh, let's say, on my side, because as, as Volkan is explaining you, there is a first step of architecture and providing the environmental input of what the building will look like. But then there is a different step when you are designing the services and you are trying to carry the design. The beauty about Taylor 10 is that we all focus on sustainability. So it's as much of a passion for me as it is for Vulcan. And when I'm trying to provide solutions in terms of the selection of equipment and in terms of the system for the client or the architects or in general, the design team to select, I, I bring that on the table as well. And we are very lucky to work with organizations that are driving their sustainability objectives and they, they are looking to understanding and and adapting their ideas in order to not only comply with the goal of a 
of an uh, criteria, but also to provide the client with with something to be proud of. So yeah, I will say that mm. that uh, we we see it all throughout the process. So not just from the beginning, but all the all the way to the end. And uh, right now, there is uh, various um, guides and, and standards that we try to follow, but the the biggest um, input or let's say the opposite, the output is when you actually are working in the mm-hmm. building and it's actually operating. Have we achieved those those goals? Have we actually uh, ensured that both the design team and the maintenance or the operational team are are working together so that the building is providing what it needs? I think I think that's the the best part of, of creating a, a construction industry. That's actually a really crucial point that isn't made enough. And I, th- I think in the architecture space, we're becoming a, a little more aware of the importance of, say, post-occupancy evaluations. Um, I know that an argu- a, a, a stumbling block is often, this is a bit of a deviation, I think a stumbling block is often with post-occup- post-occupancy evaluations is who pays for it. Because a client, they might not be as keen after their building is built and it's operational. There's not as much perceive value in them commissioning post-occupancy evaluations. So there's always an awkwardness around that. But I, I think it's something which has been overcome, but it, it, it's a really important point, which is that, and well, I, I, guess, I was about to say that there's no substitute for having to build building. Like, I guess Vulcan, you might say, well, you know, we have we have data now. It, it's becoming, that playing field has been evened a lot more, but having a built operational building with the all the, say, known unknowns of, mm-hmm. of human use and human, human behavior, human, human instinct, uh, it's such a crucial way of understanding how we, how, how are we, ben- how are we performing versus our benchmarks? How, how are we actually advancing sustainability in the real world and not just on paper? And I, I'm going to get in a second, actually, to how the, how the two of you kind of collaborate and how you work together. One really interesting question that I thought about when I was looking at Tilly Town's work, and this might be a bit too specific, but Zaha Hadid architects are often known for these very fluid, parabolic, complex forms. And at a very, very layman's term and a very surface level, when I look at that, I often think that must be so difficult for an engineer to to work with, present, you know, presented with these very fluid parametric forms, how, how you can integrate standard, I don't want to say standard services, but how you can, how you can integrate best practice and established understandings mm-hmm. of mechanical systems or electrical systems into what are often very novel and new age forms. And I guess the question which emerges from that is, do, do you have to tailor your approach to mechanical systems or data systems or lighting or, or modeling of, of, of lighting and air systems do you have to tailor that a lot depending on the specific architects or do you think that your is your approach kind of structured or in such a way that you can apply the same principles and the same approach to to to, to whatever the project so i guess and andrea is it is it is it more difficult to incorporate mechanical systems depending on the different projects and vulcan same particularly with particularly with modeling i would imagine is it does something like a zaha Hadid building present a totally different challenge to say something more um, more geometrically mm-hmm. conventional uh, than than the, the kind of curves. And uh, I don't know who, who wants to take that first. Maybe, I'll, I'll maybe start giving comes. Andrea a bit more time to think about it because it's a difficult question, right? <laughs> um, the first thing I'm going to say is this though. Um, you know, let's take the Zaha example with the beautiful curvy uh, you know, design that is there. Um, it is a challenge, but it's an opportunity at the same time, depending on where you are. Because a lot of the times, uh, what feels like an arbitrary sort of gestural line, especially in the hot practice, actually more than uh, many other sort of similar, uh, you know, design aesthetic driven uh, practices, it actually is usually driven by some sort of parameter. If you make that parameter environmental design or something that is driven, you know, responding to the outside conditions, then you can turn that form freedom into something that works with you. Uh, in the case of BIA headquarters, for example, that also recently opened, uh, this is in Dubai, uh, you know, we've designed this sort of sand dune responsive building that is fully 
develop with the environment in mind. You know, like okay, this side is the the one that is blocking the you know the sun and the prevailing wind and the dust storm versus this side is opening up the homogeneous sort of northern light without getting the solar gains around it and so on. And that freedom of form actually gives you those kinds of flexibilities that if you get in early on. Uh, people like Zaha's team, you know, like they're actually very open to because it actually gives them something to uh, rationalize in their design as well. It doesn't necessarily drive them toward the box, but it drives them something towards that is better performing potentially than that box uh, if, if utilized rightly. But is it a pain to model it and give them feedback? Absolutely, right? Uh, there though, what I will challenge and introduce is this. Um, if the intent of the model, there's one of these sort of quotes that I love bringing up essentially, you know, this is from George Box, a statistician, uh, that all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? If, if the intent of the model is to capture the, you know, the whatever number you are chasing to the seventh decimal with the precision of whatever you want to do as a sort of physicist, let's say, then it is pain. But, the underlying building physics, the underlying first principles, the underlying sort of factors that make an idea a good idea or a bad idea can become very visible very quickly without going to that end detail of getting the exact precision of the model, right? Of course, that takes a bit of uh, experience. Of course, that takes a bit of understanding of these sorts of all sorts of first principle physics and, you know, background uh, ideas. Uh, but if you have that, then you don't need to be intimidated too much by the complexity of the of the modeling exercise that it might require. Right? Um, so, so you know there are opportunities that way, uh, and you know we see it we see it across the board really. Even even simpler buildings sometimes can be simplified even more in terms of modeling and still get very useful output to steer the design in the right direction. Mm. Andrea, how does that how how does that compare to you? How does to what to what extent does the the architectural vision influence how you how you work. I'm kind of I'm asking this for the audience, but also like me as an architect trying to figure out how I can not burn <laughs> bridges between between myself and engineers, or how we, and, 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 and in all seriousness, how how can how can we find uh, f find uh, a balance between visionary thinking in, in an architectural sense and and flamboyance in an architectural sense, but also something which is going to perform. Uh, so yeah, so how does yeah to, to, what, to what extent does the architectural vision influence how you work? I will start with the example you just gave about Sahar Hadid and the curves. Obviously, provide a different input in terms of the the services that we will suggest. And let's say, for example, in this building, instead of doing the services at high level because there was so many curves, we tried to look for the the flat surface, so a low level in the floor. Hence. From there, you already drive the coordination of services. And following on from that example, I'll give you another one, which is the Google project in London, where there were, mm -hmm. uh, there are at least 12 different floors, and all of them have a different shape, a different angle, a different coordination. And there is a model that Volcan refers to, which is the energy model and how um, do we understand the principles of the ventilation within the building? And at the same time, there's a different model, which we use normally uh, a software called Revit, where we create the detail of the distribution of services and we coordinate that with architects, architecture, uh, structural engineers, etc. And that is also something to keep in mind. Each floor will be different. Each, each level will need to be designed, will need to be looked into detail. And it drives a bit more requirements to make sure that each level is correct and um, in this specific project we had the opportunity to work with virtual reality which help you to understand a bit more what what, what will be the feeling of not just the client when they arrive to the site but also from the contractors to understand in in 3d and uh, an, an image and the, uh, the, of the dimension of the services that, that we're creating so i must say that we have an excellent tool in order to c combine all of the information required from different um, teams, because it's not just the design team, it's also the, the constructors, the, the ones who give you the detail of, of the connection um, that bring in information into this model. And going back to the original question, which is, does it bring a, a different level? It does, because each each team will now have to think 
on all of those differences. Mm. Let's then try to come back because we've talked a lot about the differing roles that you both have within Atelier 10. Let's maybe try and, is there a particular project or types of projects that the two of you often work mm. together on? where you kind of combine your expertise. I, I know you, we mentioned before, there are one or two that we, they're, they're still in production, so we don't want to go too much into too specifics, but just on a broad level, can you give, give an insight into uh, how your two roles mm -hmm. gel together on, on particular mm -hmm. projects? Yeah, I mean, the, the most obvious overlap obviously ends up being the energy side of things, right? Uh, because um, at the end of the day, when we come up with a concept that might be very promising in terms of uh, you know, operational energy of the building and maintaining comfort con conditions inside the space. Um, it needs to be bound to the reality of delivered actual products that have the pipes and the ducts and the selections against it and so on, right? And we actually come from uh, different perspectives and try to come towards a you know, coordinated solution between those terms. And I'm not saying that, you know, uh, the engineering team only looks at the ducts and the pipes and so on and so forth, but they actually have much more direct experience in terms of the practicalities of things, that the actual delivery of the, of the final product. Whereas from our side, let's say, from the environmental side or the data side, it's a bunch of numbers that work. If I put a controller here and run my simulation, it gives a stellar, you know, result. But actually, you cannot measure that thing there, and you cannot really control this thing against you know what you measured in that point. And actually, you know, one of the projects where uh, we very closely collaborated with Andrea in this case uh, was this uh, very complex distributed uh, sort of almost like a master plan, a new development uh, where there were very high ambitions in terms of environmental design goals, uh, very restricting sort of limiting environment because we were actually almost like twenty kilometers from the nearest. Uh, development so everything had to be self-sufficient on site and also very unconventional means and spaces because we're actually drilling inside the rocks of you know um, a mountain as opposed to you know, literally creating a cave pattern as opposed to having a building where you have control about the heights and the orientations of things and so on again very liberating but also very challenging at the same time for that project we had to work on very closely you know together about the size of the equipment and what they can deliver in terms of the you know uh, the comfort conditions that we are seeking and so on and so far that we we had to be together for it to come together in the end and that's that's that was the end result mm -hmm. really so we were uh, you know we developed a lot of different models for a lot of different conditions together uh, and you know us driving from the sort of the more the conceptual side maybe and then Andrea coming in for example with the the real world background, a little bit more engineering thinking there, that, you know, I'm signing off this as an engineer, you know, this is my responsibility from now on kind of uh, attitude. And that, that's that's what is needed because actually, but we know it quite often uh, in, you know, uh, in the out, you know, world out there right now, there's great interest in sustainability and get, there's great interest in pushing the limits, uh, but it can be easily disconnected from the reality. And that's where the collaboration with the actual design engineers comes really becomes very important. And that's the culture we're trying to promote, obviously, in house by having both disciplines sitting next to each other and collaborating on projects like this. Mm. Andre, what do you think about that? What's your what what's your lived experience of combining your your real world with uh, Vulcan's world of of data and and numbers and simulations? I thought it was amazing. I think that as an engineer, we all need to understand that that basic requirement of what is this strategy? Why are we doing this? And, and why uh, the efficiency of one equipment will mean a lot later on. I must say that uh, one of the key lessons I, I, I took from, from this specific project was the coordination with the controls team and how the controls of, of the system in general can make such an impact into the Usage, usage of energy or yeah, um, the, uh, the requirement of the building. So it, it made a lot of connection on the beginning of the design on how do we collaborate at the end of the design with that controls team and make it all happen. Mm -hmm. To zoom out of Atelier 10 then, and, and again, to maybe uh, not split up, but to, to to focus on each of your your individual passions and interests. What, when you look to the future, what excites you the most about where your 
where your particular fields are going. So, for example, you know, Andrea, what what, what excites you most about about the future of of mechanical engineering? Again, this 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 might not be what your interest is, but almost every week or every month, I'm seeing new ways of 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 using solar. Uh, you know, in, integrating solar tiles, for example, like you know the, the the Google example is 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 one there of of of, of finally applying um, what for years has been this. Uh, um, elusive idea of, of creating roofs uh, almost entirely out of solar tiles, but uh, digressing a bit. But yeah, what's your what excites you the most about where where your field is going, Andrea? And then maybe we'll get to Vulcan. There are different sides of the um, MEP design, and that is, let's say, for example, I'm, I'm not only doing the mechanical side, but also coordinating the project management of how do we coordinate with the rest of the team. And what excites me there is that we can propose in any field different solutions, electrical, uh, mechanical, etc. And at the moment, I believe the connection with the grid is very important. How we're making the selections to become more dependent of what the grid is doing instead of a local energy source. Because by doing that connection between local building and uh, uh, countryside wide grid, we can actually open opportunities yeah. to new renewable energy solutions. Let's say right now it could be more solar panels on the specific country where that building is. In the future it might be hydrogen. Different different solutions that, that will work together, but at the end, by combining their efforts, they will provide a much more sustainable input Twenty million. So I think that that I'm, I'm really looking forward mm. to that. That's really, yeah. Sorry, sorry to cut across you there. That that, that that's really interesting because, uh, as you say, there there is a lot of conversation, particularly in the UK, which I guess is the 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 kind of common thread between all of us of you know decarbonizing the grid and uh, looking at the the national grid as a good kind of lynch uh, uh, pinch point of how to. Uh, how how to focus on the input of one one uh, one element uh, of of the built environment, uh, which is you know the how how we're fueling our, our 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 national grid, and then it also distills all the way down to the the local local production energy production of of a building. Um, you're also starting to see as well the, the the middle the middle ground between the two. You you often hear about microgrids now of of or kind of community level grids of of um, different neighborhoods or buildings within a Within a particular uh, vicinity of each other, kind of feeding, uh, feeding each other, and uh, and and sustaining each other. Yes. Um, Vulcan, you you're, you're under time pressure, so we need to cut to you as well. What's uh, uh, for, for probably the most right, complex right, question right, as no. well? What's the what fascinates you? I mean, right you now the two the things, well, two two and a half things that uh, fascinate me is obviously being a bit of a data guy, the prevalence of data, and what we can get out of that. Um, and I, I say this because we, we've, over the past many decades, uh, introduced a number of, uh, you know, uh, sensors, like as in, in a building, you may have thousands of sensors now that are constantly collecting data. Uh, right now, no one is looking at this. Mm. As you said, you know, there's, there's hesitancy about the post occupancy evaluation. There's also hesitancy about looking at these things and what it is trying to tell us essentially. And I think once we start tapping into it, that requires a different level of computer literacy, data literacy, and sort of you know, understanding of control and all those things. We will actually be able to feed it back into design and actually get better designs out of it, hopefully. So that's one territory. The other one that Andrea briefly alluded to is the digitization of design experiences in, in, a, in a new way. So you know, what's coming next is sort of this, this virtual, in fact, XR, as you can call it, AR, XR, VR combination, uh, where we are looking at, uh, you know, designing, to enhancing designs before even they are there, but actually having a very sort of direct personal experience uh, with what is being designed, being able to see things before they're in there and being in that space, you know. And I think that will enable a lot of things, including the materialization of some of the architectural elements, right? Some of this, it's sort of this, this digital overlay might actually slowly become an additional layer of, um, you know, additional layer of uh, the 
experience that you have that you don't need to have physically, signage-wise, language-wise, and this can actually be enabling in terms of disabilities, in terms of access and so on, you know, languages and so on. So there's a lot of opportunity that way too. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last one to me more immediately actually is sort of acknowledging the variability of things more directly because a lot of times we design for one specific condition in mind, you know, like the, the glamour shot of the building at this time with this kind of angle, it will look like this architectural equivalence of this. But actually things are very dynamic out there. The sun moves, the, you know, like the temperature changes and being able to capture that and design against it with a higher sort of awareness of those changes will actually make us better. And linking that back to what Andrea was saying, you know, even carbon grid factors and things like that, they change by the minute, you know, if you look at it that way. We are still at the range of saying, okay, this year it was this many grams of carbon for kilowatt hour of electricity. But actually the reality is much more dynamic. And as we start absorbing this more and starting to design again that more, we will actually be able to deliver uh, you know, better designs and better solutions for the environment, actually. And I look forward to that as well. It's a challenge, but mm. we'll get there. <laughs> Absolutely. To wrap this up, uh, Andrea, maybe, what's your, what advice do you have for people who want to grow their understanding of sustainability? I mean, the, the, the elephant in the room, of course, we, we, have, we run a website <laughs> which is dedicated to that. But uh, even beyond that, what, what advice do you have for people who are interested in sustainability, don't have a massive background in it, uh, but maybe are part of the production of buildings or the design of buildings, but Want, want want to learn more about uh, sustainability in their own field and maybe also how teams like Atelier 10 and people like yourself and Vulcan uh, can, how they can better collaborate and communicate with people. Uh, well, like let me uh, touch into different points there. As business technical advisor and the share your own design team, um, very excited to bring into different organizations the opportunities that Share Your Green Design can give. And these can focus on the uh, giving publicity and giving, giving knowledge to the public uh, about mm -hmm. different research that the companies have created or case studies of the projects they all have studied. And um, it, it will involve, let's say, jobs specifically related to environmental design and sustainable solution as well as the the blocks blocks that anybody will, will like to kind of focus on and competitions on this so what i'm trying to say is that there is a, a wonderful database of information that we're building and we are connecting this in an international way which is something quite new um uh, from my perspective in, in the environment and it, it enhances the collaboration in internationally and with that said my second point will be sharing sharing will be the main the main advice i will give mm. uh, for anybody who has already touched into this industry because there has been different efforts already created but it's about connecting and making sure that others can use a similar strategy Hence, for anyone who would like to, to join, who would like to be part of this, who would like to learn even just the basics of sustainability, I will, I will say reach out to, to organizations like this one, to websites like Share Your Green Design, where we try to bring the basics to, to, to the people who want to learn more about it. Mm. What about you then, Vulcan? What's your, what's your advice for people who want to grow their, their own ability to contribute towards sustainability? in the built environment like i know what one i know one thing selfishly that i would love to hear from you is how can we how can you say architects like myself how can we grow our knowledge of software because i we kind of touched on before but there's a massive opportunity to learn lessons and to understand performance before any any material gets shipped before anything gets put in the ground uh, before any um um, embodied carbon emissions are, are contributed. Um, how can how can people better equip themselves to uh, design and construct yeah. more sustainable um, buildings? I believe we are right now in a transition period of sorts, and I'll come back to the question answer quickly. But um, right now, there's a lot of resource, right? Everybody out there is trying to develop something because we are in a genuinely in an emergency mode, rightly so. Uh, which then makes it really difficult to sort of filter out the noise and focus on the 
the things that matter. You know, for any analysis that I can suggest or think of, there are probably 20 different tools that we can be using. Uh, and chances are there will be 40 tomorrow, right. and only three of them will actually be there in the 10 years time frame, essentially. So uh, for me, for me, really what matters a lot of the time is that, uh, you know, focusing on things that are not just a single track. You know, so so don't don't just pick up something that does X and does X super well, because as I was alluding to earlier, um, doing X super well is not really where the value lies. Where the value lies a lot of the times is to getting the big decisions right and understanding, you know, what what are the sort of the right directions. How can we make the the best of the available options essentially, even if it's not necessarily the perfect option just yet. Okay. Um, and I think I think that's uh, where, where one of the big pitfalls are really, you know, approaching the digital design elements essentially uh, in terms of their usability. Does it work with your design? You know, some software works better with particular kinds of designs versus others work with others. Um, and I think being aware of that, being purposeful about what you want to study is really the actual genuine key, key step that the architects should be aware of in that sense. Um, but, you know, it's one thing also to develop a software kind of version of your building but actually making sense of the results or what, what you see in there is another one as well. And I think, you know, there will be specialization, obviously, you know, some, some, some practitioners will be more focused on certain aspects of it than others. But I think, you know, there is, uh, it's, it's the vast sea. There, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff to, to be absorbed. And I think, you know, people like us will be there really to, to make sense of some of these things. You can do earlier design, but, you know, big decisions and looking at what the impact of that might be. But actually, you know, there, it's, a, there's, it's a separate discipline for a reason in that sense. But I do agree with Andre. Mm. I think, given where we are in terms of uh, you know the global crisis that we are facing, and really a lot of focus is on climate change right now. But actually, there's many dimensions to it that we need to attack as quickly as possible as well: biodiversity loss, you know, degradation of soil, and you know, resource limits, and so on. Um, you know, we need to share. Like, we there is no point of all of us reinventing or trying to do the same same thing again and again because we are in a different practice because we are doing different things. And that's where actually things like, you know, the LETI, the London Energy Transformation Initiative, really make a difference, actually, where, you know, people from different disciplines, different backgrounds, different interests come together to figure out what is the key message that we want to share. I think we need more of those. We need more of that grassroots activity, essentially, of people trying to uh, share what they're doing uh, and collaborate, really, because that's the only way we will really properly be able to solve this problem without much more catastrophic consequences, essentially, than we already baked them, you know. Yeah. Mm. Couldn't agree more. Uh, final question to both of you, then. When you when you step back and look at your trajectories, say, in your own career, in your profession, and broadly uh, in the built environment, are you hopeful or pessimistic about our ability to combat climate change in the built environment? Maybe Andrea first. At the moment, I must say I'm actually a pessimistic, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Why? Um, it is a big step that we need to take in the right direction. And there's, there is a lot of effort. There is a lot of input. There is a big team uh, in terms of um, internationally and in the terms of politics that is driving this and, and making sure that there is more people connected. But there, mu there must be a bit more so that we can arrive to the right level of mm -hmm. impact on, the, on, on time. So um, I, I, I want to I wanna be part of the team who is doing something about it. So we just need to get to, to a, an, another level, so hopefully soon. And... Once, once I, I will probably Absolutely. change my mind. <laughs> uh, Volk, yeah, so you, I'll, I'll, I'll throw the ball out of the field if you, if you mind, if you don't mind that. Uh, I'm not a pessimistic optimist. I don't think it matters, but I think uh, we just need to, you know, not worry about pessimism or optimism. Just get on with it. Do the best we can do, and you know, make sure we need to be enthusiastic. We need to be energized and you know, like active. Uh, and whether or not it uh, is then bringing the best solution and, you know, the, the, what keeps us within 1.5 degrees or not is, I don't think it's, it's even a relevant, you know, question in that sense. We just, we have a big mountain to climb. Uh, we, even the things that we take for granted, you know, like things like, oh, operational energy. We know how to build a net zero building because there are 20 net zero buildings out there. Yes, indeed, they are there, but 
Oh, there are also 20 million not net zero buildings that are being built right now. So we need to keep working on these things. But, uh, and, and, you know, that's why I actually refuse to almost like commit to one or the other because optimism in some ways gives you sort of, like, okay, you know, we can relax. Pessimism is like, oh no, we are screwed anyway. I think we just go out of that. We just need to remain focused and motivated and energized, keep pushing, keep doing whatever we do best so that we can, we can hopefully overcome this with minimal damage, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> I love how the, the the question that I ask at the end is evolving because I remember on the first episode, David Wall. I originally the question was, "Are you optimistic or pessimistic?" And David Wallace was our first guest, and he said uh, he doesn't like the use of the word optimistic because it's too it lets us off the hook too much. He mm. said he's hopeful, not optimistic. So then the question became, "Are you hopeful or pessimistic?" And now, Vulcan, since you you said that, I'm probably going to introduce us a third definition: as "Are you hopeful?" pessimistic or just <laughs> about the about the future yeah. but uh but anyway for uh listen i um greatly appreciate you both being here it's been really fun to have uh two different perspectives uh two, two common but also uh unique perspectives in in their own way um about uh about the built environment uh for people who want to learn more about your work or yourselves where can they where can they find you well for me there isn't actually a lot unfortunately i can offer i kind of distance myself a little bit from social media as a person uh but obviously i'm not very difficult to get a hold of uh you know Volcan Dora. if you it, it, funny enough i think it's the only person in the world that i'm aware of that shares the full name uh, so chances are you will stumble upon me if you just Google and, you know, uh, hit the bubble button to contact somewhere, LinkedIn or, you know, email or something like that. Yeah. The one and only, pretty the much. The one and yeah. only. And uh, yourself? Um, it's <laughs> yourself, a bit more common. Andrea. So I do uh, share a link, which is HTTPS MII from Sabmi, that BIP slash Andrea Riz. So set MII, MII that VIP slash Andrea Riz. So what I'm trying to put there is my LinkedIn, any connections with Cherry or Green Sign, and hopefully any future interviews. Awesome. This was a really interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for giving the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you for the time. That's really, really lovely.